Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar on the roots and nature of the Syrian revolution. Uh, we have a really exciting discussion coming up with three incredible speakers. My name is Shireen Akram Boshar, and I'm currently based in Boston, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Uh, the webinar is uh, the first in a series focused on the history and politics of the Syrian revolution, uh, which will feature webinars on imperialism and anti-imperialism, feminist politics in the Syrian revolution, uh, the second wave of uprising in the Middle East, North Africa region, and connections between Black Lives Matter, Palestine, and Syria. Check out our Facebook event page to find the details of uh, these upcoming webinars. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to thank Haymarket Books and Pluto Press for hosting this teach-in. We need bold, radical ideas right now, and it is critical we support independent publishers. You can do this by buying books directly from Haymarket Books and Pluto Press. This video will be recorded and shared afterwards on the Haymarket Books YouTube channel. Subscribe to the channel, like this video, and share with as many people as possible. We'll have time for Q&A. Please post your questions on the live video feed wherever you're watching it, and we'll get to these later in the program. If you want to turn off the comment stream, you can just close the comments window. Now it's my pleasure to bring in Anand Gopal, Yasser Munif, and Lubna Meri. Anand Gopal is an award-winning journalist who's produced vital research and writing on Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. His forthcoming book on Syria will focus on the city of Menbij and its two-year revolutionary experiment. Yasser Munif is an assistant professor of sociology at Emerson. He's co-founder of the Global Campaign for Solidarity with the Syrian Revolution. And his book on Syria called The Syrian Revolution was just published uh, this year. Lubna Meri is a Syrian journalist, writer, and photographer whose work has been published in The Nation, Time Magazine, and Vice. She's currently writing a book, uh, a memoir, on her experience and participation in the start of the Syrian revolution. So thank you so much for e each of you for being here and talking to us about grassroots politics in the Syrian revolution. Take it away, Anand. Thank you. It's great to be here. And I want to apologize in advance because I uh, haven't had a chance to have a haircut in like five months. So I apologize for that. Uh, so usually when we talk about the Syrian revolution, uh, we usually started 2011 with the protests. Uh, but I actually think that starting in 2011 obscures a lot of the context and actually makes it difficult or more difficult to understand it because the revolution like any revolution is a really complicated uh, event so what i want to do today is to actually take a step back and look at some of that context by trying to relate to you the history of syria with an eye towards trying to explain why the revolution happened and why the revolution took the form that it did and the trajectory that it did so uh, I'll start by focusing in on a place that I've been working on a lot, which is the Euphrates River. Uh, you've probably heard of the Euphrates River. It's one of the you know cradle of civilization. It's a uh, place that's been inhabited for tens of thousands of years. It runs north to south in Syria, and it's in the eastern part of Syria. And uh, back, well, today, if we give up to one of the major Syrian cities like Derzur, Raqqa, which was the capital of ISIS and later, uh, sadly, was more or less raised to the ground by a horrific American bombing campaign. the land that was held uh, formerly by the Sultan. And they gave these lands to their allies and to people who were loyal to them primarily tribal sheikhs and businessmen, in exchange for their services for helping to quell nationalist resistance against the colonial occupation. Uh, so they went to tribal sheikhs and gave them vast tracts of land, like tens of thousands of acres. 
And what emerged in this area were a series of basically feudal estates, or a, a, the term originally from Latin is latifundia, um, which uh, you may all have heard in the context of Latin America, which are these massive estates with peasants working the land and uh, a single family or a single man who actually controls everything. Uh, this was the case all up and down the Euphrates River. And uh, these feudal estates were sites of extraordinary exploitation. Uh, peasants were living in abject conditions here. Uh, there was actually slavery in, in many of these feudal estates. And the slaves were sometimes Kurds, sometimes Arabs of other tribes. Uh, the feudal lords who, who wielded over these realms uh, did everything they could to keep the peasants in horrible conditions. So, for example, they tried to block the building of any roads into these villages. And they tried to block the building of any schools. The reason being, they didn't want outside ideas, subversive ideas like equality, to enter into these areas. So they did everything they could to try to keep the people in abject misery in, in, in these regions. And uh, just to give you a sense of how unequal the land ownership was in the, in the 20s and 30s and 40s. If you look all up and down the Euphrates, which is about 500 miles in Syria, just 40 men owned 90% of the land. That's tens and tens of thousands of acres owned by just 40 men. And just 10 men owned 70% of all irrigated land. So that was the scene uh, on the Euphrates uh, in 1946 when Syria won its independence. And for the next decade or so, Syria engaged in a democratic experiment. There was actually a, a flowering of democracy in, that, in, that, uh, in those years. In 1954, Syria uh, undertook what was probably, I think, the first democratic election anywhere in the Arab world. There was uh, freedom of speech. There was uh, the growth of political parties. Unions uh, emerged in this period. And the, the main political actors, who are leaders of the biggest political parties at this time, were actually some of the same people who wielded over these feudal estates. And uh, they call themselves liberal, liberals, and they would uh, argue for freedom of speech. So for example, in, in Damascus, you had these, these uh, liberal elites who are, who are um, saying, we need freedom of speech and freedom of uh, assembly, at the same time as they were maintaining these vast feudal estates in the countryside, in the Euphrates, and actually maintaining slaves. Uh, this isn't unique to Syria. This is actually the story of our own country in fact, and many other places, that, that the contradiction of liberal elites who claim to be talking about freedom, in fact, and at the same time as they are implicated in the most abject forms of oppression and exploitation that one can imagine. What all this meant is in the 1950s, the question of land became the central question, uh, the central political question, because land ownership was so exploitative and so unequal. The liberal elites did their best to maintain that system of land ownership while championing other forms of freedom. So naturally, this created opposition to them and a huge space to their left emerged and uh, left-wing parties began to emerge in the late 1940s and the early 1950s. One example of a left-wing party was the Syrian Communist Party. Uh, but the Syrian Communist Party was mostly based in cities and they were mostly oriented towards uh, the urban working class. Another left-wing party that emerged, it was much more successful, was the, was the Ba'ath Party, the Arab Socialist Ba'ath Party. And a central plank of the Ba'ath Party was to orient on the question of land and, and on the horrible conditions of the countryside. And one of the slogans they had was that essentially uh, each person who tills land should have the land he tills. So um, land for the person who, who works the soil. So uh, with this type of slogan and with this type of orientation towards the peasantry, the Ba'ath Party grew extraordinarily rapidly. So I think in 1949, in the elections, parliamentary elections in 1949, the Ba'athists had like just a couple of seats in parliament. By 1954, they had quintupled their uh, share in parliament. They went from a party of 500 to 1,000 people to within 10 years to like 50 to 100,000 people. So they became a mass party. And the reason they became a mass party is because they were the only party in Syria at the time willing to tackle the core question in economic life at the time, which is the question of land. So uh, the democratic experiment failed in 1958 when uh, there was a coup and uh, Arab nationalist 
took power. A series of coups ensued, uh, various different uh, groups uh, overthrew each other. By the 19, mid 1960s, the Ba'athists firmly were in uh, control of, of power. And one of the first things they did at that point was to actually follow through with their, uh, their, their basic platform, which is to do land reform. So they broke up these massive feudal estates. They divided up the land and handed it out to the peasants. They ended slavery. This is very interesting because slavery existed more or less in various guises on the Euphrates River until 1963. They ended slavery, they, they distributed land, and they broke up the power of these, these magnates, these massive uh, feudal, feudal lords. And in, in doing so, they actually erected a, a political system which was unique in the history of Syria and uh, actually was something they inherited from the, the Arab nationalists before them. And the, I want to describe a little bit of how this political system works because it's very important to understand it if we're going to understand the subsequent trajectory. So what they did is, on the one hand, they banned all independent political activity. So they banned unions, independent unions, they banned independent political parties, uh, the right to strike, uh, strikes were banned at that point. And at the same time as they did, they did that, they set up all these government controlled bodies. So they created unions, they, they banned independent unions and they created government controlled unions. They banned uh, independent political parties, but they allowed government controlled political parties. So if you wanted to take part in polit political life or, in, or if you wanted to, to uh, be in a union to be able to better your working conditions, you had to do it through the government controlled institutions. At the same time as, it, as they, did, they did that, they also set up an economic system that created the, what was essentially a social welfare uh, safety net. So I'll give an example of, in, in the Euphrates region. What they did is they took a lot of the land and after distributing it to peasants, they created what were called agricultural cooperatives or collectives. And these agricultural cooperatives functioned in such a way as to the state would provide seeds to you, the farmer who's a member of this cooperative, the state would provide seeds to you at a subsidized price. They would provide equipment like tractors and other such things, also at a subsidized or cheaper below market rate. Then it would provide to you cheap credit so you can use that credit to buy the tractors and buy the other things you need to, to, to grow your crops. And then the state, and this is very crucial, the state would guarantee the, that they would buy the, the produce that you grew. So that means that no matter what happened in the world, if there's a drought or if the price of cotton collapsed or whatever, you as a farmer would still be guaranteed an income because the state had guaranteed to buy X amount from you. So what this system effectively did was create a kind of a, a baseline guaranteed income and a social safety net that sheltered the poorest members of society from the vicissitudes of the free market. So now you have two two things that the Ba'athists did. On the one hand, they eliminated all independent political activity. And on the other hand, they created a type of social safety net, not a very good one, but at least one that kept the very poorest of the, pop of the society from abject poverty. And this trade-off between surrendering independent political rights and getting a basic uh, social safety net is a type of social contract. It's a social contract in the sense that you agree to surrender your right to organize independently as a union, and in return, we will, you know, give you basic health care and basic welfare. Now, when I say that you surrender your right to independently organize politically, it doesn't mean that there was no way to politically influence policy. There actually was. For example, let's say you lived in a village on the Euphrates and you wanted a road to come through your village. Now, you couldn't elect uh, somebody to go to the city council or to the village council because there was no free and fair elections. It was all controlled by the regime. You couldn't protest for it because those were a banned. You couldn't strike for it. That was banned. But what you could do is you could see if your friend or your cousin or your neighbor could get on the peasants committee or could get on the bath party committee or one of the other committees. And he or she could influence the main Ba'ath Party boss or peasant party boss to, to, to divert resources to your village to build a, to road, build a road. So this way of using personal connections 
to influence public policy or person or for getting personal goods and services in Arabic, the, the term for this is wasta. So effectively, the the these uh, the systems that the Ba'ath Party created was to say you can use wasta to get goods and services. You can actually do it independently through political organizing. And so that's what people did. And uh, you know, Wasta was a way in which a village could get a, a road if you happen to have somebody who was on the right committee, for example. Okay. So the social contract was the basis of the Ba'ath regime. Hafez al-Assad uh, came to power in 1970. And for the next 30 years, from 1970 to 2000, the social contract was the underpinning of Syrian society. Not just Syrian society, by the way. This is also the case in Egypt and other parts of the Arab world, but I'm focusing on Syria, okay? And what was what was important for us to understand is on the one hand, of course, the regime was a horrific regime because if you in any way, uh, you know, tried to organize independently, if you, if you in any way brooked, uh, if, you know, the, if, you, if you in any way went against what the regime wanted, you could be disappeared, you could be sent to gulags, you could be tortured, okay? But if you kept your head down and didn't try to get involved in those things, then you can expect actually a modicum of a social safety net and even a type of social mobility. The reason I bring this up is because it's important to understand that the Syrian regime didn't just rule through terror, but actually they did have a social base in the 70s and 1980s. They had a social base, particularly among the countryside. And there were millions of people who had been illiterate peasants, but then their children went to university, became teachers or civil servants, got a job in the government, and they actually saw uh, social mobility between generations, that their, their children had a slightly better life than they had. This was the base of the Syrian regime, Hafez al-Assad's regime, through the 80s and 1990s. Sorry, so the 70s and 80s particularly, and then also in the 90s. Um, so what that meant is it gave the Syrian regime a type of resiliency to be able to withstand withstand opposition. So one example of opposition is the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood um, started an insurgency, and groups associated with the Brotherhood started an insurgency in the late 70s. By 19, 1982, it became a full-blown uprising in the city of Hama. Now, the Brotherhood owed its social base, its, its support, specifically to big landowners and to merchants. And why? Because the landowners, these were the people who actually had lost out from the land reform. These are people who owned these vast tracts of land and exploited peasants, and then the land reform took away their privileges and took away their power. Merchants also chafed under various Syrian regime policies to control prices, to monopolize foreign trade and structure. So the, 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 the merchants and the landowners support, supported the Muslim Brotherhood uprising in 1982. Now, the issue, though, was that the majority of Syrian population, especially the countryside, either stayed neutral or actually supported the regime. Because of that, the regime was able to isolate the 1982 uprising, mostly in Hama and parts of Aleppo, and crush it killed tens of thousands of people, they were able to crush it and move, move, out, move forward. It's because the regime had that social base to do so. Beginning in the 1990s, that situation started to change. The social safety net, the social contract in general, began to come under strain. So I'd like to describe why it became, uh, came under strain. So the social programs that the regime was was uh, was um, enacting, um, the social safety net that people had, the regime was paying for it, not through taxing the rich, because there wasn't a very big capitalist class. There wasn't a very big wealthy class to be able to tax, right? There wasn't a revenue base to do so. So what they were doing instead was taking foreign aid, mostly from the Soviet Union, and also selling oil and natural gas on the international market. And that was Great, as long as it lasted, but then in the 90s, a few things happened that changed the, the calculus altogether. First, in 1991, the Soviet Union collapsed, so the regime lost a major source of its foreign aid. And then also in the 1980s and 1990s, the price of oil collapsed. So with both of these things happening simultaneously, the Syrian regime was facing a crisis where it was no longer able to rule the way it had been ruling for the previous 30 years. It was no longer able to fund these social services and at the same time keep a tiny capitalist class. 
So um, beginning with Hafez, but really in 2000, when Bashar al-Assad came to power, it, it, it veered into a radically new policy. And that policy was um, twofold. One was to try to grow the capitalist, the domestic capitalist class, to create a new capitalist class inside Syria that would be a base of revenue that, that, that can then be used for social programs and other programs. At the same time, it, it tried to decrease the size of the of the social programs by cutting subsidies, by privatizing collectively owned or state held land, by um, undoing some of the very elements that had lended resiliency, resiliency in the 70s and 80s. So in effect, what Bashar did when he came to power is he undid the social contract that had been the basis of the Syrian regimes from, from the very beginning. So in doing so, there were three groups of losers. And I think it's really important to understand who these losers were because it'll directly lead to the shape of the Syrian uprising. Okay. The first group of losers in this process, by the way, this process of privatizing um, collectively or state held assets and growing the domestic capital, capitalist class and integrating with the world market, the term for that is neoliberalism. So Bashar took a neoliberal turn in 2000. So three big losers losers of the neoliberal turn, the first one and the largest group was the peasantry. These are people who were being thrown off the land in the early 2000s. They were um, people who, like I said, they benefited from subsidized seeds and the government buying produce at a, the harvest at a certain price. All of this uh, all of this was thrown into whack by 2000, 2001. All the collectives, the cooperatives that I had mentioned before, the peasant cooperatives were dissolved, most of them. State-owned land was privatized. As a result, millions of peasants were thrown off the land. Effectively, this was almost like a, a, a reversal back to the pre-1960s order. This is what Bashar did. So a lot of these peasants were thrown off the land. Some of them ended up as day laborers and construction workers in Lebanon, in Jordan, or in the Gulf. Others gathered in cities uh, like Aleppo particularly Eastern Aleppo. So shanty towns were growing up in Eastern Aleppo, very poor areas where people had just, just either themselves or their parents had lived in the countryside and now they were in, in Eastern Aleppo. The suburbs of, suburbs of Damascus is another example. Eastern Ghouta was a place where a lot of uh, people uh, ended up, for example. So you had uh, this, this mass of Syrian people, I would say probably the majority of them, who, who were impoverished and now gathering around these cities or had gone abroad. That was the first group that lost uh, out on the neoliberal forms. The second group that lost out uh, were people who were middle class people who had gone to college. Um, normally, they would have graduated to become, they would have gone to teacher training college and and uh, become teachers, for example, or uh, maybe lawyers, etc. And remember, the way they used to get jobs is they would go, uh, they would graduate, then they would join some government sanctioned body, they would know somebody and through WASTA, they would get a good job near their home and near their family. A lot of those mechanisms fell apart. You know, now to have WASTA, you have to really know somebody who's really closely tied in with the, the leadership of the regime. So people, a whole generation of people who normally could have had WASTA or those personal connections through the various government sanctioned bodies in the 60s and 70s and 80s, no longer were able to do that. So it's almost like there was a privatization of WASTA itself that happened. So you had a whole layer of uh, professional middle class people who now couldn't find jobs, or if they could, they couldn't find jobs that were any better than what their parents had. And so the, the kind of intergenerational social mobility that you saw in the 70s and 80s ground to a halt. That was the second group that lost out in the new liberal reforms. The third group that lost out is all of these uh, smaller businessmen and uh, capitalists who mostly were in the countryside in small towns, towns like Nimbej, Raqqa, or places like Idlib, Dara. Um, because actually when the regime turned towards neoliberalism and opened itself to the world market, it didn't do that just in a sort of sort of fair way where every businessman could now compete for for contracts or com compete for uh, building building um, you know facilities but you had to be very closely linked to the ruling regime to Bashar right so I'll give you an example in Membej there's uh, somebody I know who in the early 2000s he was a businessman 
in the early 2000s, he wanted to create a resort on the Euphrates River. Uh, and, you know, so he went through the various bodies and the bureaucracy to get the permits to create this resort. But at the end, and it was approved, okay, but at the end, he was about to start building and all of a sudden somebody came to the construction site and said, uh, actually, you can't build this. You need to give 50% of the stake in, uh, of this resort to Rami Makhlouf, who was, uh, at the time was one of the richest people in Syria and was a cousin of Bashar al-Assad. So, and obviously he couldn't do that because he wouldn't make a profit. So you had a whole layer of... I would call you know lesser uh, capitalist, uh, provincial bourgeoisie, provincial business class, who didn't benefit from the neoliberal opening, and which is interesting because normally we think of neoliberalism as benefiting the capitalists as all, overall, but actually created a, a, a wedge within the capitalist class. Um, so you had these three groups that were all disaffected from the neoliberal opening. That's very different from the early 1980s when the Muslim Brotherhood rose up. They didn't have a social base beyond the old elites, and so the regime was able to crush it. This time, when I'm talking about these three groups, that's like 80% of the population. So the regime wasn't able to isolate it in places like Hama and crush it. Instead, it became a full-fledged revolution. So just to wrap up, I want to just point to two, two issues here, which I think are important to, to, to contend with if we're going to think about how the revolution uh, proceeded. The first is that uh, you'll notice that the communities I'm talking about, the groups that lost in the revolution, the peasants, this middle class and these provincial elite, most of them are not in Damascus or in Western Aleppo or not in the places where wealth and capital and all these things are concentrated. They're in the hinterlands. They were the ones that really lost out. They're in places that really didn't have a lot of importance before 2011 in Syria, places like Idlib or Membej. So that's why the revolution started in these areas. Dara in Idlib, uh, Raqqa, these places that were kind of secondary in the political economy of Syria. That's why the revolution started there. And to this day, they've been kind of the, the heartland of the resistance to the, to the Syrian regime. The second point I want, I want to just uh, raise is that uh, I've described a situation with, in which there were three different social forces inside the revolution. And in the beginning of the uprising, in the beginning of the protests, Everybody across these three social forces were agreed that they wanted the dictatorship to fall. They wanted some semblance of democracy. They wanted some kind of political freedom. Everyone could agree on that. But beyond that, they couldn't agree. For example, on the question of the price of bread, um, or the question of whether you should control the price of bread and put price controls in. Actually, some of the, the, the business elite from the provinces sharply disagreed with the poor on this question. So on, so there was two, you know, Khreya, which is uh, freedom, was something that was uh, chanted by everybody across the Syrian revolution, but there's actually different conceptions of what freedom meant. It was freedom to do things, like the freedom to speak, the freedom to publish what you want. There's also the freedom from things, like the freedom from want, the freedom from hunger, the freedom from uh, having to worry about where your next meal comes from. That conception of freedom was actually quite different for the different part, this different social forces of the revolution. So that was actually kind of a tension built in from the very beginning of the revolution. That's not unique to Syria. Of course, every revolution consists of different social forces with tensions and contradictions between them. And the tra uh, trajectories of all revolutions are in part the story of how those res uh, resolutions get, uh, those tensions get resolved, right? In Syria, the tension between those people who wanted the just the freedom to do things and those who wanted the freedom to and the freedom from want and hunger, that tension uh, was re resolved because uh, a, a political force, Islamic fundamentalists, inserted themselves into that, into that uh, debate. They inserted themselves into that debate and were able to exploit it, to be able to win hegemony over the revolution because these questions weren't sufficiently resolved by the other sides of the revolution. So that's something to keep in mind when we think about the revolution that we think of this mass of people who are uprising and who are, are, are demonstrating freedom, but you know, there's so many important divisions that this raises up and that's part of what a revolution is. So that's all I have, thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to whoever's next, Yasser or Libna. Yes. Yeah, sir, you're muted. Could you unmute yourself? Sorry for that. Um, 
Thank you, Anno, uh, for this wonderful presentation. And I think um, it's vital to start with uh, um, an understanding of the long history in Syria uh, to begin to un, um, uh, unwrap and understand the Syrian revolution, uh, class formation, class struggle, um, the way that capitalism operated in Syria since the 1950s and even before, uh, and the way it impacted the revolution is vital to our understanding of the revolution since 2011. Uh, and I think oftentimes that kind of reading is marginalized, dismissed. It's not a central piece of uh, the way we analyze, understand, or read the revolution. Um, and so what I'm going to try to do here um, in 20 minutes, very briefly, is to propose a way to uh, think about the revolution, to explore a revolution, uh, some of the conceptual tools that we are uh, required to uh, deploy to begin to um, look at different layers of, of the revolution, and then uh, describe some of the revolutionary activities very briefly, um, obviously in 20 minutes, and try to focus a little bit on Aleppo and what happened in, in Aleppo as a case study, uh, which I think we can understand a lot uh, from. So to begin with, um, we have to understand that this revolutionary process has to be uh, positioned or uh, be uh, understood in the context of structural violence in Syria. Um, that dates back, we can always go back and trace it back, but at least to colonial Syria and post-independence. And that structural violence has different uh, dimension components, economic, uh, political, and cultural. Um, and one of the uh, main pieces of that, the... Um, the uh, pillar of that violence is the prison system. And that's one of the dimension that we are going to explore in this web series uh, in the coming weeks, uh, because we don't, we can't understand uh, this, the violence in Syria without uh, exploring uh, the genocidal violence of the Assad uh, prisons. It also involves daily humiliation and uh, dehumanization of Syria. Um, and uh, in part, uh, Syrians, began their uprising as um, an uprising for dignity. Uh, and they were demanding that uh, dignity. They politicized dignity. They were marching and risking their life for, for dignity. And they were confronting an authoritarian culture uh, where people worshipped Assad in, in different ways, where the slogans were, we uh, love you, Assad, or Assad for eternity and beyond eternity, and so on and so forth. And people who uh, tried to understand the revolution by beginning in 2011 uh, can't really comprehend uh, the trauma of the Syrian people and what they went through uh, in the past several decades. And uh, obviously, there is the economic dimension, as Anon described, uh, the question of uh, land reform in the 1960s and 70s, and then the neoliberal policies later are central to our understanding of, of the revolution. So the question is why the Syrian revolution is often dimed, dismissed, uh, it's denigrated, it's demonized, and in some cases it's unthinkable. People don't necessarily uh, deploy the concept of a revolution to explore what happened in Syria, and they come up with all these different readings that doesn't involve a uh, revolution or revolutionary culture. Um, and I want to uh, argue that, um, in fact, the Syrian revolution is a, one of the cornerstones of the revolutionary wave that began in 2010, to, uh, 2011. And without a deep understanding of what happened in Syria, we won't be able to understand um, the region and, and even beyond uh, the region and the nature of that uh, revolutionary um, uh, wave. Um, that And I think that's one of the goals of this webinar series, and we're going to explore a number of uh, dimension. But one entry point is uh, the grassroots politics, the politics from below or the history from below. Uh, one way to approach this revolution is to set aside a little bit all the geopolitical readings and international politics and so on, and give a chance to the grassroots politics and the politics from below and the everyday organizing and the minutiae of everyday resistance a chance uh, and that requires time, it requires uh, a lot of um, reading and understanding and um, uh, exploration of the history uh, that oftentimes people don't necessarily have. Um, the Syrian regime used a number of tools to marginalize and crush the revolution, and we are going to explore some of these in the coming weeks. But I will uh, just 
point uh, 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 briefly to uh, some of them. The first one is obviously the militarization of the revolution and the gradual weakening of civil resistance um, and uh, uh, gradual also marginalization of uh, that kind of organizing. The second dimension is the internationalization of the conflict, uh, and the Syrian regime was, to a certain extent, very successful in imposing a geopolitical re reading and, as such, dismissing the uh, everyday resistance and grassroots politics. Um, the third one is um, the Islamist. Um, the regime was able to push the Islamists to the front and marginalize the secular, progressive, and pious uh, politics of, of the revolution. Uh, fourthly, um, the opposing the Kurdish and non-Kurdish uh, struggles for liberation and antagonizing them. And finally, I think the lack of international solidarity was very important in marginalizing and invisibilizing the revolution. In addition to that, I think there was uh, the experts' readings um, and the way that they presented the revolution and the revolutionary politics uh, played a major ro role in marginalizing revolutionary politics. And very briefly, again, I think that uh, by imposing this geopolitical reading that um, what's happening is really about states and state actors and their interest and uh, all the different actors in the region, whether that is Qatar and Saudi Arabia, and some of them presented themselves as the friends of Syria and others were opposed to Syria and so on. But in the end, and now I think it's clear um, what they were trying to uh, do in, in Syria, whether they were aligned with the Syrian revolution as, uh, as they um, claimed or not, was to undermine the revolutionary culture and the uh, revolutionary process. And they were fearful, I'm talking about Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Qatar, uh, from uh, a revolutionary culture that would um, overflow and spread in, in the region. And that's why they were uh, trying to crush it in different ways, militarizing it and Islamizing it and so on. And then there is the Orientalist uh, perspective, uh, the idea that Arabs have no agency, Arabs have no voice. Oftentimes, experts don't speak Arabic and they write about Syria. Oftentimes, they see one veiled woman in a protest and they reduce the entire uh, revolutionary movement to Islamism. Uh, they argue that Assad is at least secular as opposed to revolutionary who are pious and Islamists, forgetting that Assad's prisons are full of women who are tortured, raped and killed on a regular, regular basis. And yet Assad is presented as um, the feminist in the equation, as um, the, the secular, uh, as pushing for feminist uh, policies and um, rights. And as a reminder, um, I think it's important to uh, briefly uh, mention the scale of the violence, which was mon monumental, and we're going to look at some of that in the coming weeks. But as a reminder, uh, around 400 to 600,000 people were killed in the past nine years. 12% of the population was killed or injured. Uh, more than 600 hospitals were attacked deliberately by the Syrian regime and its ally, mostly Russia. More than 100,000... Uh, structures were damaged in, in Syria. 6.6 um, .6 million people were displaced internally and another 5.6 million uh, were um, became refugees around the world. Uh, more than 14,000 documented deaths under torture in Assad's prison and more than 100,000 uh, people are detained or disappeared in Assad's prisons. And that is part of uh, an ongoing campaign that uh, many Syrians are uh, trying to shed light on um, that uh, that violence that oftentimes is forgotten or or uh, not really in, in the picture. But to go back to the grassroots movement and the revolution culture, and I was briefly in Syria for several months um, at uh, different uh, stages in 2012 and 2013 and 14. And what I saw was uh, people, rebellious people, uh, trying to uh, liberate different uh, regions in, in Syria, rebuilding uh, the new Syria from the ground up, uh, trying to get rid of the prisons and uh, the, the uh, authoritarian culture and end humiliation and torture and, cor and corruption. And they were willing to sacrifice their lives to do that. And um, they were um, involved in creating unions and free societies of lawyers and doctors and teachers and students. And uh, there were hundreds of newspapers and newsletters. And what's interesting is um, there was such a culture in the 1950s. Often, oftentimes people forget that uh, before Ba'ath comes to, to power. And uh, people were replicating some of that. Um, and they were creating uh, autonomous zones in, in different places. Um, 
early on, they created the local committees, something that w also existed in the uh, early 20th century uh, during the first uh, revolution against the French. Uh, they were creating those uh, local committees in neighborhoods, villages, universities to organize the protest and coordinate among themselves. And Omar Aziz, one of uh, the important intellectuals who played a major role in the Syrian revolution, an anar uh, anarchist intellectual, formed the first local council in Barzi, uh, and hundreds of other councils were formed later in other places. Aziz was later detained and died in, in prisons. Uh, and later on, uh, local councils uh, began to rebuild the new Syria, uh, despite the violence and despite the, the daily bombing in some cases. They were organizing, um, people were organizing uh, strikes and makeshift hospitals and safe houses for activists and civil disobedience. All sorts of uh, resistance was, um, was uh, employed in, in Syria. But I think that uh, the main uh, thing was uh, the the protests that were daily uh, and oftentimes weekly. Uh, the Friday protests were much larger, and they were setting the tempo of the revolution. People would organize mass funerals for those who were killed by the regime, and then thugs of the regime would come at those funerals and attack the protesters and kill me more people. And such the cycle would uh, continue week after week after week. Um, and online organizing was obviously essential and arts played a major role as we will see in a few weeks. Uh, the Dabke dance was also instrumental and very important, very much like uh, what dance did in South Africa uh, to end um, apartheid there. In the liberated areas, one of the important dimension is that the Syrian regime's army and military were overstretched and therefore the Syrian regime at some point in 2013 decided to focus on what it called the useful Syria and uh, pull its forces from what it perceived uh, as unuseful Syria, the marginalized areas the, in, in, um, in, um, in, in Syria focusing instead on the big cities like Aleppo and uh, Damascus and Halab and uh, and so on, and leaving uh, other areas, but still bombing them to prevent the emergence of the new Syria, uh, because the Syrian regime in many ways was very scared of that emergence, the political emergence of a new Syria, rather than uh, the fighting on, on the fronts. Um, and people created those uh, autonomous zones in those different locations, villages and neighborhoods and cities like Aleppo and, and so on, uh, very much like in Cairo and Alexandria back in 2011 and Occupy Wall Street in 2011 and 2012 and today in Seattle where uh, people created uh, an autonomous zone with the obvious difference that people are not the target of snipers or barrel bombs and chemical weapons. And you can see how creative people are when they are able to manage and control their own lives and create alternative uh, institution and um, end the violence of the state in, in those zones. And I think this is really important for us to understand, uh, to begin to uh, un unpack uh, the the importance of, of the Syrian revolution. Very quickly, Aleppo, I think, is one of the most important um, uh, hubs or spots for uh, the revolution process. And I think it's uh, primordial or very important to understand what happened there, uh, to understand the geography of the revolution. In Aleppo, there was organizing on a daily basis and uh, some neighborhoods were uh, liberated very quickly, much earlier in a certain way than others. Uh, that included the Aleppo University and neighborhoods such as Sahur and Merje. And then the protest uh, spread to other regions. People were trying to reach the central uh, square and try, were trying to replicate what happened in Tunisia and in, um, in Cairo and in Egypt. But they, they were unsuccessful because the regime understood that um, it had to defend those squares and prevent people uh, from reaching them and killing many uh, in, in the meantime. Uh, so the Aleppo University was a big hub, and I think one of the important dimensions of that is that it has 70,000 uh, students. 70% uh, of those students are from outside the city, and many activist students were uh, actually coming from outside, from the peripheral region, northern and eastern Aleppo, uh, where uh, those regions were liberated early on because they were marginalized and the regime didn't think that it should leave uh, its forces there. And so those uh, students were bringing that revolutionary culture to the university, and uh, they were uh, bringing all that expertise that they were learning in their villages 
uh, back to the university, but also back to Sakhur and Marje and other uh, uh, neighborhoods where they had acquaintances and they had friends and families uh, that lived there. And that's why to understand the geography of the revolution in Aleppo, it's, understand, uh, it's very important to look at uh, the spatial politics and where people came from and uh, where that uh, revolution culture was traveling and how. Uh, and the Syrian regime was deploying uh, monumental uh, uh, violence in, in Aleppo to prevent the formation of the, those um, autonomous zones or semi-autonomous, as in the case of um, Aleppo University. Aleppo University was the only autonomous or semi-autonomous zone that was left in uh, Western Aleppo. The rest of the city, Western Aleppo was controlled by the regime because it's mostly upper and middle upper class uh, neighborhood. And the regime wanted to preserve those uh, areas. And most of the military bases and uh, security forces are in those regions for obvious, reg for obvious reasons. Um, whereas what Eastern Aleppo is mostly a form of uh, informal housing, poor areas, shanty towns, and uh, they were liberated very quickly uh, in July 2012 and uh, July and August 2012. And so the regime had a problem with Aleppo University, was, which was still in Western Aleppo and wanted to end uh, the rebellion there and the organizing and the resistance. There were uh, protests on a daily basis, sometimes two and three. There were two local committees uh, that were, uh, or local uh, yeah, com committees that were organizing. There was a newsletter, there was a free uh, student union that was formed. On May 3rd, 2011 or 12, uh, the students organized a massive protest, 10,000, 15,000 people gathered and they flew the flag of, the, of, of independence. And the regime was scared uh, that the revolt spreads in, in the neighboring uh, region and it wanted to preserve uh, those, uh, those regions and prevent uh, the revolution from, um, uh, from uh, taking those, those neighborhoods. And so in 2000. Early 2013, in January, the Syrian regime finally bombed the university and killed 87 students. Within minutes, Assad thugs organized a spontaneous protest and started chanting pro-regime slogans and prevented ambulances from approaching the injured and saving them. Just to give you an idea of the culture of violence in Syria and how uh, protesters were operating within that culture of violence and they were risking li their lives on a daily basis. Um, and so the regime was able to contain the revolt and uh, preserve uh, and, and maintain that revolt in eastern Aleppo within, as I said, in the poorer region and the working class uh, neighborhood and the informal housing. And if you put a map of the informal housing in Aleppo and look at the bombing of the different region and the most affected and destroyed areas in Aleppo, you're going to see almost... Um, exact matching between uh, those two areas. Three maps, uh, the poor areas, the informal housing, and uh, the part of Aleppo that were completely destroyed uh, to teach the poor and marginalized classes of Aleppo and elsewhere, um, and the rebellious classes, because they were not, I mean, it was cross-class uh, rebellion. We can't reduce it to that class dimension, but that played uh, obviously a major role. And the killing machine of the regime operated in multiple ways to crush the revolt later on, weaponizing the city demographics by turning different ethnicities and sects against each other, each other. And the regime had expertise and it performed and implemented that those strategies throughout the past several decades by uh, positing some sects or uh, demographics against others, as uh, Anand explained in uh, the, the land reform, but also otherwise. Um, Christian against Muslims, Kurds against Arabs, and so on, cutting literally the city in two and um, allowing um, the, the revolution to eat itself from, uh, from within and outside. It also crushed the Palestinian and Kurdish grassroots movements in the city, prevented the population from reaching out to each other in those neighborhood and the rebellious areas, uh, and uh, sending the thugs, the Shabiha, thousands, tens of thousands of them were deployed in Aleppo to discipline the population uh, there, and uh, oftentimes threatening the fathers and mothers of uh, activists and organizers. Uh, telling them that uh, they would be disappeared, they would be put in prison, their sister's mother would be raped if they can't uh, 
discipline and prevent their kids from going to the protest and, and so on. And finally, I would shed light on uh, herbicide as um, um, an urban or uh, urban violence that was dis- deployed by the Syrian regime. And I think without that understanding, we can't really understand how the regime deployed a certain form of violence to crush the revolution in the city, which is a different the uh, technique or strategy from what happened in the countryside. And I think it's important to understand the uneven violence that was deployed in different areas um, against the revolution. Uh, and so herbicide was deployed in, in Aleppo and uh, it combined uh, vertical and um, horizontal power. The vertical power was the combination of air power, dropping uh, barrel bombs, but also uh, putting snipers on high rises and the mosques and um, the luxurious hotels and so on to target uh, protesters and activists and oftentimes uh, ambulances and in some cases mentally ill uh, and disabled individual uh, and playing games. For example, today we're gonna target uh, pregnant women. The following day we are going to target uh, left arm of people without killing them and so on and so forth. And then there was the horizontal uh, power, which was um, basically crisscrossing the city with lethal checkpoints. Pe- many people uh, left, uh, um, lost their lives, or they were detained at those um, um, at those uh, checkpoints. And so I would end and conclude by saying that the level uh, of violence, the monumental violence that was used in uh, Syria uh, by the regime and by its allies, Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah. Uh, is important to to understand and uh, dissipate and understand the specificity of of it and so on. And I think um, that kind of presentation would require hours for us to really understand. But we have to understand that type of violence uh, was deployed because it was confronted with resistance in the city. And the same thing uh, can be said also about the Syrian revolution. Uh, The monumental level of violence that was deployed in Syria um, should be understood as a response to the monumental level of resistance and organizing and activism that was deployed in Syria. And without understanding that equation uh, and uh, trying to dismiss that and reducing the violence to just chaotic and irrational violence, I think we missed the point of the Syrian revolution. That monumental violence should be understood as fear from the revolution, from the uh, uh, revolutionary culture, fear from uh, revolutionary uh, spirit and culture from spreading the culture uh, in the region. And that's why all the people, all the actors that were um, involved in the revolution uh, were involved in a certain way to crush that uh, revolutionary violence, that, that revolutionary spirit of, of um, the revolution that could be understood in, in Aleppo, but uh, we can't reduce the geography of the revolution to what happened in, in Aleppo. And we need to also look at what happened in other re- regions. Thank you. Go ahead, Lubna. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's been a great panel. I learned so much from Anand and Yasser. Uh, let me for a second just like zoom out from uh, the uprising angle and just kind of try to zoom in on uh, what like despite all uh, the horror and the repression that Yasser was speaking about um, like in how the Syrian government uh, repressed this uprising despite all of this why so many people did not side with the Syrian revolution. And in my personal opinion, I think uh, the silent majority in Syria is the reason why this uprising was not successful. We have so many people who were against the protest, who were actually, you know, like on the rooftops, as you uh, mentioned, Yasser, sniping at activists. Um, And kind of these people for so many Syrians were like the heroes, you know, like these people who are protecting the country. Uh, from the chaos uh, and I don't know if that's going to be related to our panel but I feel that just explaining where the support from the Syrian government comes from can can kind of like help us understand uh, why after 10 years we still have people arguing that this uprising was not for them although they were not that supportive of the Syrian um, uh, government um, 
so yeah, so as I mentioned before, so I'm going to read from my notes. Uh, so yeah, so as I mentioned before, like not many people joined uh, the Syrian uprising. And in my opinion, I feel it's mainly because of the Syrian government's media narrative. Uh, during the first week of the uprising, the Syrian state TV did not broadcast anything about the Syrian uprising. Uh, the demonstrations were completely ignored and um, the government state media really tried their best to make everything uh, seem normal and, uh, you know, like no breaking news, just the usual schedule, normal uh, Musal Salat, normal sub operas, uh, animal documentaries even when people were dying and there I remember there was like this very long documentary about this like rare bird uh, in Tedmore while uh, the death count in uh, Dara was uh, reaching its 60s. Um, so for those who lived abroad, who, li who for, for, for those who lived outside of these hated areas, uh, just by watching it, Dunya and, uh, and the state TV, they, they, they felt everything was normal in the country and they had no idea that the Syrian, that the Arab Spring had uh, already began in Syria. Uh, but for those who lived in the heated areas like uh, Homs and Dara, ah, those who did not join the protest, uh, started to kind of create a backlash against this media narrative, um, saying on social media that now they are forced to watch Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya in order to know what was going on uh, in their own cities. Uh, this backlash kind of forced the Syrian government to start addressing these protests. But how they addressed these protests? They were not saying they were uh, protests against the government. Actually, the first um, uh, explanation around this protest were that uh, I remember in April 25th, the state TV uh, Dunya was, was called the Dunya TV. They uh, showed a clip of a demonstration in El Midan, and the news anchor said that um, this is not a protest. This is uh, people gathering in the street, thanking people for uh, the rain. Of course, this uh, news segment was faced with a complete backlash. Uh, which kind of now forced the Syrian government to address that, okay, there are actually protests, but this is why the protests are happening. Um, the Syrian government first started to say that these protests are not real, that they were filmed in Qatar. Uh, they said that uh, in Al Jazeera studios, they were um, mujassamat, what, what, what is Mujassamat in English? Uh, it's like they, they were uh, uh, building uh, kind of uh, copycat squares of the, you know, like famous squares in uh, Homs and Latakia. Uh, and they said that Al Jazeera was staging all these uh, demonstrations in their own uh, studios. Um, another narrative the Syrian government really tried to push that everyone who went to the protest and every person who was and like every protesters who was brainwashed by uh, Al Jazeera media they joined the protest because they were paid uh, I don't know if you guys know about this but uh, the Syrian government were saying that uh, when you go to the protest you will be uh, given a kebab sandwich wrapped with a 500 uh, lira uh, and uh, Al Jazeera and Qatar were sending pills with uh, Al Jazeera logo. You take the pill and you say Allahu Akbar in the street. Uh, so, like, I know, like, as it, ridiculous as it sounds, so many people believe this narrative. Uh, so many people believe that, okay, we are being under attack now by Qatar, by all the Salafis. And, um, and I remember in my hometown, in Jabla, people actually believed that they were really under threat, that people took out their arms and they started to patrolling the streets. We called them back then Lijan Shabiye. And in my opinion, like this, the existence of the Lijan Shabiye uh, kind of forced those who were not able to decide which side to take to actually take a side. Because if you're watching the TV all day long and you're kind of uh, Is the word it's like you're skeptical of what the Syrian government media is trying to tell you but then you see your neighbor 
patrolling the street under your house with a gun, part of you will believe that you are under danger, that you are under threat and you have to take a side. Um, I know I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I will probably focus more on, on the public support now uh, in the coastal area because it was very surprising in the Alawite community to see even those who were against the government and even those who spent years in jail after, uh, under the Syrian government uh, siding against the uprising. Um, I don't know if Fatih Jamus was Alawite, but he's, he's like, one example of uh, of of, of uh, former detainees by the Syrian government, like this person, spent 18 years in jail uh, for criticizing the Syrian government. I don't know if Yasser can correct me on this, but I think he was a uh, part of a social, uh, like the Communist Party. Uh, anyway, so this person spent 18 years in jail, and when the uprising started, he sided completely against the revolution, saying that, okay, I am against the government, but I don't want to be part of an uprising that is. Uh, led by the Salafist or like an uprising that is against the Alawite existence. Uh, I also actually had a family relative who spent five years in jail for an article uh, he wrote back in uh, 95. Uh, and growing up, I always remember this person as someone who would always speak about the day that he, um, like he dreamt of the day where he would see all Syrians in the street and like Syrian waking up and Syrian challenging the government well, like something so powerful about the government media narrative that this uprising was not for for like all my cities for for like all Syrians no this uprising was sunnah against uh, uh sorry uh, like uh, sunnah salafist against uh alawites uh and especially at uprising and during the protest were uh... hey am i here hello oh my god i'm frozen okay what did you hear last this whole skype thing is really i'm not i'm not like a not a technology person Okay, what what point you hear you heard uh, last? Okay, so uh, you know, like this whole media narrative that this is not an uprising for all Syrians; it's an uprising led by Sunni against Alawites. Um, is the reason why so many slogans in the protests? Uh, were things like Wahid 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 Shab Suri Wahid and uh Alam Suri Kaza because like activists saw the danger of the narrative that the that the state media was trying to spread and sadly in my opinion it de like it definitely worked. Um and it worked for so many reasons and I think one of the main reasons is uh the brainwashing we grew up with in Syrian state schools uh, throughout years in uh, Ibtidai and Adadi and Thanawi, you're always forced to memorize speeches by the president. You're always forced to believe that you are on this desk because of the president. You, you are always believed that, okay, now we have dams, like you have water, you have electricity because of this president. There is something about the history of Syria, which uh, Anand was speaking about, like I had no idea about. And uh, and it's sad for so many Syrians, my generation, uh, we believe this, like we really believe that the reason why we're living and breathing and going to school and going to uh, hospitals was because uh, Hafiz al-Assad was in power. and. This idea is very intensified within the Alawite community. Um, this is why when people say that Alawite soldiers are dying just to keep Bashar al-Assad on his seat, it makes me really angry because it's such a shallow explanation. Within the Alawite community, people really believe that they had to choose when the uprising started. People had to choose between death 
and chaos and salafis and security, which was being offered by, or this is what they believe, that it was offered by uh, the Syrian government. Um, and I'm, I'm here, I'm speaking about a personal, uh, a personal background, personal experience that in my hometown in Jabla, the line between supporting the government and religion was always ambiguous. You know, like for Alawites, Hafiz al-Assad seizing power in 1970s through a military coup was the reason for the Alawite existence. Without him, Alawites would have remained in the mountains. And I heard this story so many times that before uh, Hafiz al-Assad coups, uh, all the Alawites were in the mountains. We did not have electricity. Your ancestors only had burghul to eat. Uh, uh, people had to uh, walk to the shoreline to get salt. So this is stories we grew up with. This has became part of our uh, identity. So our identity in 2011 kind of became, uh, was like kind of under threat that this is not an uprising for everyone. No, this is an uprising against your existence, your survival. Um, and uh, Jabli, my hometown now, actually, it's it's called the capital of martyrs. We have more than uh, 30,000 uh, uh, killed soldier, whenever you want, whatever people call them, shaheed, uh, qatil, whatever. But yeah, like Jabli became that center of, of Assad or we burn the country, you know, but they don't want to burn the country because out of their love for the government, but just like out of fear, which is, which goes back again into very historic, very complex historical events and, um, and lies, you know, I, many people would argue with me that no, the stories about being exiled in the mountains uh, were not true, were not real. And it was made up by the Mukhabarat. Uh, whatever the reality is, these stories, these media narratives work. And in my opinion, this is why uh, the Syrian uprising failed in bringing more people to its side. Um, uh, where I was? Mm, give me a second, sorry. Um, yeah, I think that's in short. I think, uh, in my opinion, today after nine, ten years of of the Syrian uh, war, of course, it's very important to speak about the beginning of the uprising and that people had every reason to rebel against the Syrian government. But also, in order to understand the chaos that happened after, we really need to understand the root causes of the extreme support of of many people towards this government you know even though they were like kind of not that supportive of of the syrian government they felt the uprising did not represent them and uh yeah actually like in my book i'm trying to kind of to revisit all these like events all these answers uh did activists didn't do enough to kind of bring more uh, minorities to their side? Did we uh, made a huge mistake by not um, by not countering um, the media narrative, like the government media narrative in like more concrete tools, but what kind of tools did we have back then, you know? Um, so yeah, that was me in short. Thank you for listening. Great. Uh, thank you so much to all of you. Um, a lot to think about and discuss. Um, I, I think let's start uh, with talking more about um, what Yasser was bringing up. Uh, what's most often overlooked in discussions on Syria? The transformative processes on the ground. So if you could talk more about uh, what that looked like, what it felt like to be there or to be part of that, uh, how you knew this was a revolution you were witnessing, um, if we could spend just a little bit of time on that. Wait, you're talking, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I thought that was a question for Yasser. Um, for, for all of you. Uh, I'll start with myself, with my personal experience. I, when the, when the revolution started, yeah, the, the, like I, I, I kind of knew it was an uprising, but also there is part of me was always scared. Like, as I mentioned before, 
even if you're watching the media narrative, even if the media narrative is so ridiculous, telling you like, oh, there is a pill out there with the Jazeera logo, you take it, you say Allahu Akbar, it's really ridiculous, right? Like, no sane person would believe that. But when I saw my neighbors with their arms patrolling the street under my house, like, part of me felt like, you know, like, I was in danger, like, I was under threat. And, uh, and actually seeing my neighbors patrolling the streets kind of took me back to 2004 uh, when the Kurdish uprising happened. Um, back then, of course, it was not it, it was not presented in the media as a Kurdish uprising. It was presented in the media as simply as uh, the Kurds in Al Qamishli are creating problems. So I was eighth grade when that happened, and. Uh, so I was eighth grade when that happened, and I remember that our school trip got cancelled in school. We were supposed to go to to like uh, a village in Tartus, which is so far away from Qamishli. But I remember that they cancelled the trip, and we were convinced that oh my god, like the Kurds are coming to kill us because that was every because like that was the main weapon that the Syrian government would use with us every time there is kind of some some kind of rebellion happening in the country that okay there is a rebellion happening in the country but you guys are under threat and uh, and i remember like they canceled our school trip and uh, a teacher told us the story that they captured an alawite commander and they tied him to the back of the car and they were like uh uh i don't know the word in english it's like when you put someone I know. Yes, sir. Can you help pulling, me with English pulling here? him the back? Yeah, pulling him. Yeah, it's like it's like they like they tied him to a car and they pulled him till his skin came out. Like that was a story I was told when I was eighth eighth grade about the Kurdish uprising. Like this is all what we knew, and uh, so to so 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 to jump back to two thousand eleven, there was this kind of fear that we don't know what was going on. Uh, we don't know if it was an actual uprising and we were under threat. So uh, I was kind of like, it's not in between. Like I kind of knew it was an uprising, but of course I was scared till I went to a protest and and uh, and then I saw people being killed in front of me. And I went to a protest like out of complete curiosity. And I do believe that so many Syrians my age went to protest in 2011 really out of curiosity because you know before 2011 we didn't really have like that political awareness uh we didn't know anything about the history of the government uh we didn't know what the government even did in hama this is things i all like i i, I learned mainly after 2011 and 2012. um so yeah so i went uh, to a protest just like out of complete curiosity and uh and yeah that was like a moment when i felt like uh, to quote Rani Abu Zaid, no turning back. Um, and yeah, and I feel the people really try to uh, draw conspiracies and like uh, say that we were paid or like why Syrians all joined the protest. Like you, you can't go to a protest and and witness death and witness repression on that level and go home and just forget about it. You you will, like, there is something inside of you, you will always, that will always force you to go back next day and, like, try to change that. Uh, I remember, actually, in late 2011, there was, like, a kind of um, a Facebook page that made fun of uh, the the police. It's called Tansiqiyat uh, Bashar al-Assad li-da'amat thawra al-Suriya. It's like the... Because, be, because so many people believe that the main reason why the protest became way bigger and many people joined the protest was because the repression that people were seeing in the streets. You know, you can't just like turn a blind eye. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's in short. Yeah, um, I would say that um, the Syrian regime was somewhat prepared when the revolution started in mid-March 2011, after the what happened in Egypt and Tunisia. And um, as my, many of us remember, uh, Tahrir Square was very mediatized. There were 500 uh, journalists, there were 
uh, hundreds of cameras and people were following the pulse of the revolution for every moment. They were aware of what was happening every moment. And the Syrian regime wanted to prevent that from happening in Syria. And it imposed a complete blackout and it prevented journalists and activists and international delegations and what have you from entering Syria. And that's why the experience of people on the ground and what they saw and what they witnessed and their lived experience is very much different from people who were trying to understand from abroad, where oftentimes the narrative is controlled. Uh, the Syrian regime was able to control the narrative to a certain extent and its allies and, and other actors and focus on the violence and the irrational killing and the sectarian dimension and so on. We have to remember that every revolution starting from the French Revolution to the Commune to the Spanish Civil War and Revolution had irrational and you know cheap violence, revolutionary violence. Um, the question is who controls the narrative and what do we highlight? And as um, 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 was, was said earlier, um, the moment the person participate in the revolution, it's, it's a very existential uh, moment. It's a moment where one feels uh, that they are reborn. It's a moment where you are defending your dignity. It's a political moment, but it's also an existential moment. And that's very formative uh, for people. It completely transform people, their identity. And I think uh, to a certain extent, people are experiencing that now in the US, uh, people going to the protest and witnessing state violence and um, juxtaposing the narrative of the media to what's happening on the street. And that's exactly what people in Syria were witnessing as uh, um, Lubna was describing the narrative of the, of the regime, the hegemonic narrative of the regime, and what was happening on the ground were geometrically opposed. They were very different. And oftentimes, people living in a certain neighborhood, seeing the protest starting in that neighborhood, and people being sniped or uh, attacked by, by thugs, their experience from the balcony was very different from their neighbor who were living just one block uh, away. And uh, one would support the revolution, the other one would not because of what they perceive from their balcony or not. Um, so there is this micro politics that I think is extremely important to understand the revolutionary processes. And that's why I think we should shift our understanding to micro politics, to the politics from below, to grassroots politics, uh, and not reducing uh, revolutionary uh, culture or politics to simply what happens um, at the level of geopolitics and international re relations. Do you want to take a stab at that question, Anand? Uh, sure. Um, well, the question is, when did I realize it was a revolution? Or how did it look, I guess, from the ground um, when you were, I know you spent time in Menbej, um, for example. Yeah, I mean, I, the, f the first time I came to Syria as a journalist, as opposed to as a tourist, was early 2012. And this was shortly after I had spent a lot of time in Egypt during the Egyptian revolution and Libya uh, when Gaddafi was overthrown. So uh, what struck me immediately when I came to Syria was just how similar the uh, protest movement and the resistance movement was, both in discourse, both in iconography, in, in um, the, the conceptions of what they thought they were fighting against. They thought it was a sort of broader international struggle uh, that they were uh, part of. So in some senses, it looked very familiar. Uh, of course, it, it verged pretty quickly because of the repression of the regime. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I went to towns and cities that were liberated, that had expelled the regime. And as Yasser had mentioned, they um, were then confronted with the, the question of how to run a town or a city uh, in the absence of government services. And there you saw the extraordinary creativity of people to to do everything from just you know keeping trash collection uh, alive and keeping the, the lights on to forms of governance. So a lot of these towns have local councils um, that uh, acted as sort of mini, mini governments. In Membej, there was a, a revolutionary council as well as like a, a custodian's uh, guard council above that that was kind of like a mini parliament. Um, so there was these kind of uh, remarkable experiments of self-governance that were taking place all, at, all across these regions. And um, just, I guess I'll just add quickly on um, a couple of the comments that Lubna had said about the Alawites, uh, you know, from, from what I know in, in distance that 
Uh, I think there's there is actually a lot of truth to the to the claim that Alawites were the were extraordinarily oppressed historically, that they were among the poorest parts of Syrian Lebanese society, that um, they were in the mountains, they were uh, the, the the peasantry, um, they lived in horrific conditions, and probably they wouldn't have. Uh, better than a lot in the way they had it had not the uh, Hafiz and his clique uh, come to power. I think there's truth to that. But uh, when the regime says that truth, uh, it wraps it in a much bigger lie, which is to say that that was that the only alternative to the abject squalor that the Alawites were living in was the kind of dictatorship that Hafiz uh, was in, installing. And that's the bigger lie. Um, it's a bigger lie that actually created the conditions in which people thought that there was uh, that either they were facing uh, Bashar or chaos or, or, or going back to the to, to the mountains, and that's not something that just appeared in 2011. That was a bigger lie that was instantiated and 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 built through the institutions of the Syrian regime over 30 or 40 years. So that it actually the irony is by by creating that lie in the actual practices of people, it became a reality. Because by 2011, when when the revolution came about, I think yes, the the opposition probably didn't do enough to to uh, reach over to try to make minorities feel safe. But that's also a reflection of the way in which the regime over 40 years had had eradicated any sort of political life, eradicated a left who historically around the world, let's be honest, is really the, the ones who carried this idea of um, trying to transcend ethnic uh, boundaries to sort of a common future that's better for everybody, eradicated the left, eradicated the sort of political structures that would make that possible so that when the revolution uh, kicked up, the the most organized forces there were Islamists who uh, were putting forth a vision that was uh, contrary to what I think uh, would be an alternative to, to Assad. So it's a truth wrapped in a bigger lie that created the very sort of mess that we saw. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, Sorry, I just I just want to add something I forgot to add, is that uh, uh, one of the main reasons why um, Alawites believed the government narrative is because we, uh, not we, I mean, it's, it's hard to say we, uh, I mean, like, uh, like uh, people in Jeble, they started to receive uh, the the dead bodies of their kids early on, even before the formation, the actual formation of the Free Syrian Army. Uh, the first uh, police officer who was killed was killed in Banyas. It was late March, uh, early April, I'm not sure. His name was Nidal Janoud, and he was Alawite. And uh, the story that was believed widely spread back then and that Nidal Janoud was killed by the protesters in Banyas. Nidal Janoud was the Alawite uh, police officer who was killed by the Sunnah protesters in Banyas. If he was really killed by the protesters, I have no idea if he was killed by fellow police officers to kind of uh, create this narrative against protesters. I have no idea. What I know for sure that Nidal Janoud became the uh, it's not a poster uh, child, but but like he like his picture was on TV every hour, you know, like his his picture, bloodied face, uh, his wife crying, his uh, kid like hugging his dead body. It was all over social media in Jabli and the whole coastal line. Uh, so I would I would say that. Uh, the violence that was uh, used by some protesters, I mean, it doesn't really take an army to kill a person. It takes one person with a gun to, to kill uh, a soldier. Uh, that violence that was used by few protesters really uh, proved what the government was trying to tell the Alawites, that you are under attack, look, this person was killed just because he was Alawite. I remember when actually uh, the formation of the, not the formation, but like it, it was it was kind of the first um, rise of arms in Jusr al-Shughur in, uh, I, I believe it was May or June. The highway between Jebli and Latakia was packed with ambulances. The ambulances that, was, that were carrying Dutch soldiers, dead Alawite soldiers coming from Jusr al-Shughur. So, with all of that, Anand, like, yeah, even 
like Alawites who really did not benefit from the Syrian government, in a way they felt that they were being under attack just for their identity, just for their uh, how they prayed and where they prayed and what they believed in. So on the other side of that uh, coin, kind of, uh, uh, one of the audience questions is, how do you respond to claims that the opposition is all Islamic extremist? Um, Me? Uh, all of you, again. <laughs> uh, I, I would say that uh, as an Alawite who worked uh, extensively in rebel-held areas, uh, did I meet any sectarian people who wanted to kill me just because I was Alawite? Yes, I did. Was I helped by others who said, no, it doesn't matter your sect. And as long as you are, you know, like fighting for the same cause, we are with you. We don't care about your sect. Yeah, there were so many of these people too. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, uh, bizarre to try to paint all the Syrian uprising and all the Syrian opposition in one light. Uh, I feel it's like kind of trying to make right. uh, the narrative very simple and it's it's not simple. You, you have 24 million people, of course we don't all have the same uh, like mentality. Yeah, just because me and another person were fighting the same enemy, of course doesn't mean we're fighting for the same goals and the same future of, 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 of Syria. So yeah, it's not all extremists, but of course there were extremists. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying against that, but uh, it's very important to note here that these radicals were fighting both the Syrian government and activists like myself. And activists like myself who were kind of fighting on, on like all fronts too, so. It's not as simple as black and white. I, I would say um, that, again, we can't really understand uh, the current revolt without understanding the long history. And the long history is that Islamism in the region is a result of dictatorship, not the other way around. Uh, dictatorship in the region posit themselves as secular and always use the threat of Islamists and fundamentalists. Uh, to secure and maintain and justify, legitimize their their power uh, to the West and also to their society, diverse societies. And so Islamists are often used as, as a potential threat and that um, they're perceived as the unique or uh, only alternative to dictatorship. But we have to also remember that uh, dictatorship in Syria and um, beyond have crushed the left, have destroyed um, independent unions, um, have contained any independent political parties and uh, made it impossible for um, any political spaces uh, from emerging. The only place where politics could happen were the mosques. And after crushing the Islamists in 1980s, uh, the uh, Assad uh, regime, like many others in, in the region, um, for example, allowed Saudi Arabia uh, to fund uh, Islamist uh, Salafi in uh, in Syria, fund schools and fund sheikhs and, and so on, um, openly um, as as an an alternative to the Muslim Brotherhood, and at the same time was putting uh, leftist progressive in prison oftentimes for decades, um, torturing them, killing them, exiling them, destroying leftist parties, and making it impossible for the left and progressive forces from emerging or operating in, in Syria. So uh, it's a logical result of that politics that uh, has been around for, for decades. Uh, in addition to, I, I think it's important to remember that the Syrian regime is really, un uh, the Syrian revolution is really uneven. Um, some people called it as the thousandth uh, village republic. Um, what's happening was really specific to every region. Some areas had very progressive forces, very solid and organic councils. Other areas were dominated by Islamists. And so I think it's important not to um, overgeneralize or make it seem that there was um, a coherent or even experience everywhere in Syria. It wasn't. Also, can I just say one thing that I found it really Islamophobe from people who try to paint all uh they try to paint a village or a city or like a group of people as extremists just because they are wearing 
headscarf. And I've seen that a lot happening on social media just because a girl is in Idlib uh, live on Facebook trying like to explain what's happening uh, there. Like their main question is like, oh, they are like they're they're forcing you to wear the hijab or or like why you're covered. And I find it. I mean, we know there is insane Islamophobia towards Arabs and Muslims, but it's really surprising and bizarre to see this Islamophobia coming from people who should be our comrades in the struggle, especially left leaning people. Uh, yeah, I'll just add that, uh, I mean, anytime uh, a government or a state somewhere is facing opposition or resistance, the government will try to paint it in terms that justify violence against it. That's obviously what Trump is doing when he calls all Black Lives Matter protesters Antifa, for instance. Uh, it's what the American occupation in Iraq did when it tried to claim that everyone who was resisting against the occupation was Al-Qaeda. Um, this is just a standard way in which states respond to, to uh, threats to its power, and we should uh, have the critical faculties to be able to recognize that Syria is not exceptional. So, uh, you know, that we should not have a Syrian exceptionalism that somehow Assad is telling the truth, but all of the states everywhere else are, are, are lying about this. Uh, and just to make it more concrete, uh, for example, in the city of Membej, uh, Membej was liberated from the regime control in July 2012, and then for about 18 months, it, it ran itself as like this kind of mini republic for, you know, it, just in that city. Uh, at the time, there was 13 newspapers that were in circulation. Before, there was just one state-controlled newspaper. Now, there's 13. And if you look at those 13 newspapers, uh, they were uh, run the gamut from liberal to secular to Islamist or everything else. It was a you know it was a hodgepodge of various political tendencies, all at the same time. Uh, there was around 40 different groups that were like incipient political parties that are all there at the same time. Again, you had Islamist groups, you had liberal groups, you had kind of putatively non-ideological groups, you had everything all at the same time. Finally, there's a temporality to it because uh, in the early years of the revolution, the liberals and the, the secularists and all these were in the majority, 2011, 2012. Over time, the quote-unquote extremists, the Islamic fundamentalists became hegemonic. And there's a whole process in which that happened that has to do with the violence of the regime. It has to do with the ways in which foreign states like Qatar were intervening. It has to do with the question I mentioned before about the divisions within the revolution. So all of that has to be understood. It's very simplistic to say that they're just all Islamic extremists. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but we are uh, at time now. Um, there's so much more to discuss, so I hope everyone does join us um, in the, uh, the rest of our webinar series. Uh, the next um, webinar is next Saturday at the same time, so do uh, find and uh, check out our Facebook page, which will have all the, the webinars and their details listed there. Um, thank you so much to the three speakers, um, and uh, we'll see you and hopefully, hopefully discuss more later. <laughs> Bye.